Hear, it, hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. A reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. But there will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Natali. But in the later time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness shall have great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as people exult when they divide plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. Here ends the reading of the word that gives us insight to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Will you pray with me? Creator God, you have made each and every one of us wonderfully unique, and you have named us as good. Help us to acknowledge our nation's original sin of slavery, the way that racism has shaped this country. Give us eyes to see the way that racism still manifests in obvious and in subtle ways, and grant us vision of that day when you will weave a diverse tapestry of your beloved community. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Well, as you know, People all over the country will be celebrating the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tomorrow. And by celebrating, I mean that people won't be going to work. <laughs> Hopefully, some communities will be doing some, some good events, helping to improve the community. There are marches planned around the country. Perhaps some people will think about the history of racism in the United States, and maybe some people will think about the way that racism is manifesting now in old and new ways. As we get started this morning, though, I'd like to just take a quick survey. If you'll just raise your hand, I wonder how many of you have been inspired by the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and generally approve? I'll raise my hand first. Look at, look at that. Look at that. It's pretty much unanimous, I think. Um, you know, in 1968, when he was assassinated, you know what Martin Luther King Jr.'s approval rating was? 33%. 33% of people in the United States thought what he was doing was worthwhile. And that number was even lower among white Americans. How do you go from 33% to 100%? Inquiring political minds want to know. Do you have to be assassinated? How did he go from such a low approval rating to such a high one? And why was his approval rating so low anyway? Well, as many of you know who lived through that time, Martin Luther King Jr. had done such important work in the late 50s and the early 60s. Uh, he had led the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He had given his I Have a Dream speech. He had received the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's where a lot of times we like to stop the story. But he kept asking questions. 
And he kept advocating. And towards the end of his life, he started asking questions that especially white folks found to be more dangerous. Like, capitalism can be kind of dangerous, can't it? It can perpetuate runaway individualism. And he started to advocate for a universal employment, a guaranteed annual wage. And people weren't so thrilled about that because then all of a sudden you were risking their money and power. Then he took that whole nonviolence thing really far and started to talk about applying that to governmental policy. He gave a famous or infamous speech at the Riverside Church in which he condemned the Vietnam War, something that was already very controversial in American society. And so, a lot of folks weren't real happy with Dr. King. How did he go from that person that only 33% of Americans approved of to someone that people all over the political spectrum are going to be celebrating tomorrow? People all over the country, people with all kinds of different viewpoints are going to be celebrating Martin Luther King. You know, I think in part, it's because the American saint that we have made Martin Luther King into is someone who we can tell his story just however we want, right? Since he's, he's not here, we can tell his story exactly how we want to tell it. If we want to feel hopeful about American future, we just play the I have a dream speech, and it will warm your heart every time. If we want to talk about King's nonviolence, we talk about all he accomplished through nonviolent resistance. If we want to be okay with a little bit of violence, we tell the story of Martin Luther King Jr. at the beginning of his life when he had a handgun. If we want to talk about radical social policy, we talk about the end of his life, where he was talking about universal employment and a guaranteed annual wage. If we want to be a little more comfortable with capitalism, we tell the story of the beginning of his life, where he went from an elite university to desiring a comfy life in the South of an academic. You see, we can tell the story pretty much however we want, which is why people are able to be comfortable with him. But we shouldn't be too surprised by this in the church, right? We're familiar with this because it's what we did to Jesus. <laughs> I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? You can tell the story of Jesus however you want to. When the faith went from being the religion of Jesus to being the religion about Jesus, this is exactly what happened. You see, if you want to find comfort in Jesus, you listen to him say, come to me all you who are weary and carrying heavy burden and I will give you rest. If you want an apocalyptic Jesus, you listen to the parable about the thief in the night. If you want a nonviolent Jesus, you listen to his parable about turning the other cheek. If you want a Jesus who's a little more aggressive, you talk about Jesus going into the temple and overturning the money tables. You see how this works? Here's the thing. As human beings, we like to sanitize stories. We like to sanitize stories. We like to make them nice, clean, and tidy so that they can, so that they can fit into a little box and, and we can use them the way that we need to use them. But I hope this isn't a surprise for you all. Life is messy. And human beings are imperfect and are messy. And if we want to understand a real life and legacy, we've got to look at their whole life, their whole legacy, and what that teaches us about a person. The only way to tell Martin Luther King's story is to tell his story. To say that this is a man who was educated at Boston University, an elite private university. He had his PhD, one that scholars now think he plagiarized portions of. He moved down to the South 
wanting a comfy academic career, wanting to be comfortable. And he got roped into the civil rights movement, largely because he was the new guy in town and didn't know any better, and also because he was a gifted speaker. And before he knew it, he was leading a movement. He didn't embrace the idea of nonviolence right away until it became clear that it might be effective. There's a story about Ralph Abernathy coming to visit Martin Luther King Jr. in the early days and almost sitting on his handgun that was sitting in the chair. It was only through seeing the power of nonviolence and studying with Gandhi that he began to realize that it could be a real powerful source for, for social change. And as time went on, it went from being simply a strategy to something that changed his heart. He traveled all over the country, advocating for policies that really made a difference, which meant that he often found comfort in the arms of other women. He had a trajectory. And as time went on, he began to move into places that made people uncomfortable. And at the end of the day, was he a perfect person? No, because nobody is. Nobody is. The story we tell about Jesus is important too. Jesus was a Middle Eastern Jewish peasant who was homeless, wandered around, and hung out with people that most churches wouldn't want to sit in their pews. Prostitutes, sinners. People said he drank too much, he partied too much. And he spoke the truth in love to religious authorities and to political authorities who didn't like what he had to say. And he ultimately gave his life for that. I think the messy story is a powerful story. I think the imperfection is perfection. And here's why. Because if God can use messy people, if God can use imperfect people, and those are the only kind of people that God uses because that's the only kind of people there are. If God can use people like that, then you know what that means? It means God can use you and me too. God can use us to do small things that can make a big difference. Both Jesus and Martin Luther King Jr. knew that not everything was going to be accomplished in their lifetime. But they both had a vision for the future where everything would be better, where there would be peace, but not just people holding hands and singing together. There would be a, a presence of justice, right? Peace is not the absence of violence. It's the presence of justice. For Jesus, it was called the kingdom of God, the reign of God. For Martin Luther King, it was called the beloved community. And the author of Isaiah tells us what that would look like. And so I'm going to end today with these words from the scripture lesson. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken. May God use us, you know, the imperfect people of the world, to help break the rod of the oppressor and to make this world a little bit better. May it be so. Amen.